We're back in the book of Genesis today, and we're fastly approaching the end of it, and we're looking at uh, the end of a life. So let's, uh, let's just pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for every soul that is here, and I pray that you help us to turn our attention to you. It's so easy to get caught up in the in the hurry and in the bother of this world and forget you. I pray that you might speak to each one of our hearts today, that you might feed us as the good shepherd does his sheep, so that you would come and speak to us like a father does to his children who loves them. I pray that you might give us insight and wisdom into the things that we find in your word, that you might mold us more into your image. So, Lord, we present ourselves before you as your children, and we pray that you have your way with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're back. We're in chapter 48 of Genesis, where Jacob is going to bless the children of Joseph. If you remember where we were last week, we saw Pharaoh meet this man, Jacob, or Israel, who he had not met. And they ended up coming from the land of Canaan because there was a famine. Joseph reveals himself and all of the brothers, there's 70 in, in total that end up coming out to see Joseph. And they're going to move into a beautiful land where there's lots and lots of uh, places for their sheep and their cattle. So he, he meets Pharaoh. And in the midst of all this, he... Uh, he gets introduced, and Joseph tells him, listen, when, when you meet Pharaoh, make sure you tell him you're a shepherd. Wink, wink. You get it? Make sure you tell him that, because what he's going to do is put you in the land of Goshen, which is kind of far away, and that's really a preferred place to be. You don't want to be in the middle of the world and into the Egyptian worldly behavior. It would be better to be on the outskirts of that. And so I think Joseph is wise in doing that. We see that they land in Goshen, which is this wonderful, fertile area over in the, the delta of the Nile. Um, so they're, they're coming from Canaan up in this region here down into the, the delta, um, which is very, very fertile and things grow even in difficult times. And so after the introduction and they mention that they're, you know, herders, he says, okay, cool. Well, we'll put your way out there. And they were like, that's exactly where we were going. <laughs> and Joseph already told us to do that. So they go out and then Jacob comes up to Pharaoh and blesses him. And we're going to see him do that in this chapter too. In fact, we're going to see him do it in the next chapter too. Jacob's just full of blessing. And so he, being the greater, actually blesses Pharaoh. Here's the guy, the, the, the king of the known world in that time, the only place that had food anywhere in the area. And he presumes to go up and lay hands on him and pray God's blessing on him, which is rather amazing, which tells me there's, there's nobody that you can't pray with. There's nobody that you couldn't walk up to. And I knew, a, I knew a man who would walk the streets of New Brunswick. And he actually would sit on a bench and he had a cardboard sign that said, we'll pray for you. And he just sat there in the middle of the busy area and people would come up and they would just start talking about things they were struggling with. They would weep and they would ask for prayer and he would get the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Uh, it, was a, it was a great, great way for, for him to be able to spread the gospel. And all he had to do was just sit on a bench with a sign. Amen. And there were lots and lots of people that he laid hands on and blessed. And it didn't matter who they were. Some of them were professors at Rutgers and some of them were students and some of them were moms and dads and, you know, regular people. But it, it was just an amazing thing that he found such an audience just by putting up a sign and say, we'll pray for you. So I expect to see all of you with a sign. No. <laughs> That's one man and one man's ministry. So Jacob is asked, so how old are you, Pharaoh says, <laughs> which is, you know, you never want to ask that of a woman, right? Um, how old are you? And he's 130 years old. And he talks about the, the, the years of his life being few. And he talks about how horrible and terrible his life has been and how he doesn't live up to his his fathers, his forefathers of 175 and 180 degree, uh, 80 years old. So 
he he's just full of negativity in front of Pharaoh about what his life has been full of evil. Um, but we know that that's just the way he is. He's just a very depressive type. He's just a very, um, you know, things are bad. And we've seen him do that in several places. But he's not gone yet. And so they end up packing up and moving out, and they leave the city area, and they go out to Goshen, and they settle in. And then we see Joseph, he actually goes to work, and he's collecting money, and he's busy in, in the land of Egypt, making sure that everyone has grain, settling disputes, all of that going to work because there's still plenty of famine left to go around. So he's quite busy with doing all of that. So they give all of their finances uh, until they don't have any more money. And uh, we talked about how the Lord asks all that of us and more. And eventually he got all of their cattle. And they said, well, that's all we have. And if we don't sell our cattle, then we won't have food to eat. And so they get rid of all their cattle and they give that to them. And then, of course, the next thing they had was land. All we have is land. That's all we have left. That and ourselves. So take all of that and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. And then there was an arrangement made. And he says, well, I'll give you seed to plant and you can keep farming the land and still living on the land, but just give Pharaoh 20%. And so you can have 80% and give Pharaoh 20%. And they didn't even have to have the seed. It was already provided for them. So it wasn't a bad deal. It, I don't think it's a, uh, a key, uh, you know, to say socialism is a great idea for the government to own everything. But gee whiz, if they only ask 20%, that might be a good idea. But they usually ask closer to 50 when you have a socialistic uh, environment like that and few people in control. So he gets all of the people and all of the things and he gives them to the king. And we saw how that's what the Lord asks of us, right? Doesn't he ask for everything of us? All our stuff, all our finances, our land, our lives, everything we had, the Lord asks. And I think about the, the widow who gave the two mites in Luke 21 and how Jesus acclaimed her to have given more than anybody else because she gave out of her need and not out of her surplus. And there's something about when we sacrifice and we do that for the Lord that glorifies God like nothing else does. And for, for us to do that, that's what Jesus asked us to do. And so he's now reaching mile marker 147. He's going to be 147 years old, and this kind of tags into the next passage. Jacob, or Israel, is 147 years old, and he realizes he's at the end of his rope. He's at the end of his life. And he calls Joseph, and he says, listen, I need you to make me a solemn oath here. Put your hand under my thigh, which, that's very uncomfortable, I can imagine. Uh, without pants, that's very uncomfortable. And he says, I want you to swear to me that you won't leave me here, that you'll take me out of Egypt, and you'll take me and plant me back where I came from in Canaan. And so there's a place where he wants to be, and Joseph tells him he will. So we see Jacob's life kind of coming to the end. If you think about the book of Genesis, it's about four great events, and it's about four great people. If you remember, it began with Abraham, and then his son Isaac, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, which takes up 25% of the New Testament. So we're seeing these four great lives and we're seeing God's salvation being revealed all throughout the Old Testament and the promise of Jesus coming. But he spends 17 years. It's interesting that, that he's able, Jacob is able to spend 17 years with Joseph and Joseph is kind of taking care of him for 17 years. And if you remember, he was 17 years old when he was thrown in the pit and sold off. And so his dad took care of him for the first 17 years of his life. And now Joseph's able to take care of him for the last 17 years of Jacob's life. So I just, I just think that's interesting. So we're going to look at Jacob blessing Joseph's sons, beginning in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, look. Your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. I see a couple of things in here. You know, it's said that there are seven great decades in a person's life. 
80 if you're, you're given strength, and then anything beyond that is definitely God's gift to you and to the rest of us. The first 10 years of your life is about spills. It's about spilling this and spilling that and learning how to work a cup instead of uh, taking it out of a bottle and, and working your way up and, uh, you know, falling down and getting up. So spills of that nature. And then the next 10 years are drills. Your, ma your math, your times tables, words, what's an adverb, what's a noun, what's a, all of the schooling that happens <clears throat> between 10 and 20 and some vital years that happen. The next stage of our life are the thrills. Between 20 and 30, you're discovering who you are, you have your youth, you, ha you have a couple dollars in your pocket. By then, hopefully, you have an education and you've settled on what you're going to do with your life and you, you have a, you know, somewhere where you're able to be gainfully employed. And you know, all of those things that happen between 20 and 30, we're calling those thrills. And then at that point, you may settle down, get married, have a family, and then you have bills. Between the, 30 and 40, you, you're concerned with what has to be paid, what you can afford, where we're going to go. You're, you're thinking about all of those kind of things, those decisions now that you're settled. And then from 40 to 50, there's the ills where you begin to lose capacity, where things begin to slow down, where you, you notice that sleep is not all night. And it's not as sweet. I, I, I think it was in those 10 years, I, I don't sleep through the night anymore. I toss, I turn. I'm uncomfortable in every position. Ugh, sleep used to be so good. <laughs> I remember that. I remember sleep. I would, I would, in the military, I would shut my eyes, lay on a wool blanket with my hands behind my head and go to sleep until the drill sergeant came in with all the noise. And I woke up in the same exact position on a wool blanket. Yeah, that was in my early 20s. Not anymore, because there are ills. You know, this hurts, that hurts. I got to go check. I got to get a procedure. You know, it's always something. <laughs> you have ills. The next 10 years of your life, it's about pills. You got to regulate this. You got to regulate that. The doctor found this. The doctor found that. And so you get into the pills, and then the last stage of your life is the wills. What you're going to leave behind. My kids already have things claimed. I, I don't know if your kids do this. My, my, we, we have this oil painting that I bought a million years ago. And my son says, you know what? When you die, I want that. And I said, you know, here you go. I took it right off the wall, gave it to him. There you go. You can have it now. So you don't have to wait for me today. Thanks, Dad. You know, and so it's hanging up in his house. But what will you leave behind? It's inevitable, you know, death and taxes. What will you leave behind when your life is over and when you reach that stage, if you reach that stage, because our life's but a vapor that's here for a moment and then gone. You don't know what tomorrow holds. But if you get to the point where you're actually giving stuff away or you're going to leave something as a legacy, what will you leave? It's a good question to ask. What will I be leaving when I leave here? It's not something that you usually think about in advance, but it's good because you can always live your life with the end in mind, and that's a good way to live. So, spills, drills, thrills, bills, ills, pills, and wills. At this point in Jacob's life, he's dying, and he knows that. You'll be tested on everything that you believe and everything that you've done. You'll be tested on it, whether you truly believe. Because, you know, it's easy to praise God when you can walk in the door and sit and you're in an air-conditioned situation and your, your health is good and things are going well and your plans seem to be happening. But when everything falls apart, that's when what you really believe is going to be found. Amen. And that kind of that shakes me a little bit because I can serve the Lord because my, God has drawn the lines of my life in very pleasant places. But will I trust him when it really counts, when I'm at the end of my life? And so I ask questions like that because I think thinking of the future helps me to live today in a better route than I would otherwise. So he's being tested and he's at the end of his rope, at, literally at the end of his life. I, I think about what a blessing it is that Joseph came to see him. And of course, he hears he's sick. And so he, he, he has this desire to go and he takes his sons with him. Let's go see him. He's 
you know, he's on his deathbed, literally he's on his deathbed. But it's an amazing thing when he hears that Joseph is coming, he gains strength and he actually shimmies himself up against the headboard and he holds on to his staff and he's holding up, waiting for Joseph to come in. Amazing what a visit will do. When somebody's in a really hard place and they feel like they're at the end of the rope and, you know, especially somebody that's at the end of their life, just a visit. I mean, you don't have to impart any gigantic spiritual knowledge or anything of that nature. Trust me, I've found that to be the case. But just spending time with people is one of those things that they understand they're not bearing it alone. When you pray with them and you show love to them and you encourage them or maybe offer some way to help, boy, what a comfort that is. Any of you know what I'm talking about? It's a, it's a great thing. And yet when I got COVID three times, nobody visited me. <laughs> I had COVID. Come on, it's a joke. Um, it makes a difference, though, when you come alongside somebody and you help them and you show them that you care. Just a visit by Joseph and his sons really perked, perked the old guy up. And he sat up on his deathbed. I mean, this is the bed he's going to die on. And he regained strength. And they say that that's actually a phenomenon for those people that are heading down that road. There's this point in which they get incredible clarity and strength and vitality just before the end. And uh, we've, in this very congregation, we've walked through um, that fire with several people. And it's uh, been a blessing to know them. So, he's dying. Verse 3, And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. If I were Joseph, I'd be like, calm down, dad. They're my kids. They're not your kids. They're my kids. But he's saying he's going to include Joseph's sons as patriarchs, as full-blown sons in the inheritance. You see, he's thinking about what to leave. And he's saying your two sons are going to be considered just like Simeon and just like Reuben, which are the two oldest ones. There's Reuben and Simeon. So he says, I'm going to take them on and I want them to be full inheritors and so what happens is Reuben is the oldest. He's supposed to get this double blessing, right? You guys know about the firstborn, that position, but also the benefit of that. There's always a double portion that gives to the elder, and they typically take on the role of the patriarch of the family. Well, what he's doing is he's giving it to Joseph, but through his children. But Joseph isn't the oldest, is he? He's number 11 of 12. Isn't that interesting? So God is Jacob's focus right now. It's interesting because we've seen his life and nowhere has he had a God focus. But the first thing he says to Joseph is what? God Almighty. Amen. See, his destination's on his mind. The Lord is on his mind. Now we've known Jacob to be a deceiver. He had to deceive his poor blind father into getting a blessing. And here he is at the end of his rope and he's blind as well, which is rather interesting. And so apparently it runs in the, gen in the genes in the family when you get that old. But he's here now on his deathbed, and his thoughts are toward God. We, we've seen him be a deceiver. We saw him uh, do all, all manner of things that were underhanded. And God came to him and gave him a new name, remember? Yeah. His name's Israel. It doesn't seem to have stuck, though. Like Abraham, you remember he was Abram and then became Abraham and it stuck and he wasn't called Abram anymore. And Sarai became Sarah and it stuck and that's who we know her as and him as. But with Jacob, he kind of vacillates back and forth. He goes from Israel to Jacob because he, he seems to always be, when Shechem was decimated by two of his sons, he says, oh my goodness, I can't believe what you did to me. He's just a very self-focused person. But at the end of his life, he's given glory to God. He's thinking about the Lord. 
I find that remarkable because being a pastor, I'm interested in life change. How do people's lives change? Boy, if you knew, you could write a book, right? And put it on the shelves and you'd sell millions. How do you get somebody to go from a, 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 a heel catcher to be somebody who's governed by God? Boy, wouldn't it be nice if you could do that? That's probably one of the most depressing things about ministry. You can't change people's hearts. But boy, wouldn't it be nice if you could? But understanding the elements of change, I think, are important. And if you understand that, at least you can do something about it. I see that there is hope that God can change even an old dog. <laughs> even an old dog. You ever figure at some point, you know, this is all there is. It's not going to get any better. I can't change. There are things in my life that I'm struggling with, and I'm just always going to struggle with them. It's never going to get any better. You know, whether it's depression or whether it's anger or whether it's lust or whatever it is, I, it's just like, I, I, you know, I guess this is just it. This is my thorn in the flesh I'm going to have to live with. Well, I look at Jacob and I see an incredible change. I mean, it's sorry that it took 137 years to get there, but wouldn't you want to do that earlier if you could? Well, the beauty is you can because you're not 137. What produces lasting change? Well, it all depends on, you know, if you go to Wikipedia or if you go somewhere else. What causes lasting change? I'm going to propose this. You need an identity change. Something needs to change about how you see yourself, about who you are. Think about it. If I see myself as a loser, what are the chances I'm going to overcome that? If I have absolutely no faith that God can change my heart, what are the possibilities that he will? If I just consent to stay the way I am and say, well, God, I know I'm, I'm pretty jacked up still, even in my old age, but I guess that's just the way it is. Can I ever have a hope of change? You don't have the faith. You don't have the drive. You don't have what it takes to sacrifice. You don't have anything. But an identity change. There's one who can change your identity. And it's Jesus Christ. I can tell you the person that I once was is not the person I am anymore. For the majority of us, we are not the same people that we once were because God changed our identity. And that is what brings lasting change. It's not, well, I need to eat better. I need to, you know, cholesterol. I have to be careful of my carbs. I have to. Lasting change happens here before anything happens. It happens here. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the scripture says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I think Jacob is finally getting that. God gave him a new name, Israel, not Jacob. But I think he just lacked the ability to grab hold of it and hold on to it. By looking at that, I can take courage and say, you know what, at 137 years, he finally gets it. Maybe there's hope for me. But we have to understand our identity in Christ. That is what will make lasting change in our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay. And so, what about the 12 tribes of Israel? If he's going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh, how do you have a dozen? Well, it's more like a baker's dozen, right? So... <clears throat> because they're going to be considered sons of Israel or sons of Jacob. There are 20 different listings of the tribes of Israel in the scriptures, all differing orders and omissions according to the application. That doesn't shake any of you. There are at least 20 different lists of all the tribes, and they're shuffled depending on what the context is. And there's omissions. Did you know that? There's an interesting passage if you go to Revelation chapter 7, for instance. You'll see there are 12 tribes that are listed there. And it says there'll be 12,000 of this tribe and 12,000 of that. There's 144,000. And it's 12,000 of each tribe, but there are two tribes missing. You didn't know that. In fact, almost every list that you look at 
Somebody has to be missing for you to have 12 because there's always 12. When it comes to inheriting land, Levi is taken out because Levi doesn't inherit property. And so when you see the list of properties, you'll find Levi has been omitted, but you have Ephraim and Manasseh. You hardly ever see the tribe of Joseph ever again. It's always Ephraim and Manasseh. I find that interesting. And when you add Ephraim and Manasseh and you take Levi out, guess what? You've got 12. And you can do this <clears throat> all throughout the scripture. In chapter 7, there are two that are listed, which you might raise an eyebrow. Manasseh is listed and Joseph is listed. But Ephraim is not. And Dan is not. But we're not in Revelation, so we'll talk about that another time. I love to pique your curiosity and have you nag me later. <laughs> Ephraim and Dan were responsible for having idolatry entered into Israel. And I'll just give you that hint. Then you can look it up. Brian, I'm sure, is already opening the scriptures. So why are there just 12 tribes? Why is God so careful to make sure that there's always 12 tribes listed and there's omissions and there's, you know, different orders and all that? Why 12? Well, consider this. As a number, 12 is often associated with government or administration in God's eyes. How many jurors do you have? Oh, I just, I, I didn't know. There are 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 princes of Ishmael. There are 12 pillars on Moses' altar. There are 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate. There are 12 cakes of showbread, 12 silver platters, silver bowls, gold pans, and service for the tabernacle. 12 spies to go search out the land. 12 memorial stones. There are 12 governors under Solomon. There are 12 stones in Elijah's altar. 12 in each group of musicians and singers of Israel's worship. 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year. 12 Ephesian men filled with the Holy Spirit. 12,000 of 12 tribes sealed and preserved, as we mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 7, and 12 gates, 12 pearls in heaven, 12 angels, 12 gates, 12 foundations in the new Jerusalem, each with new names, 12 apostles of the Lamb, its length, breadth, height are all 12,000 furlongs, and the tree of life in heaven has 12 fruits. So the number 12 is rather special to God. I'll let you figure all that out. That's a lot of work that somebody else did, and I copied and pasted it. So Jacob went to Joseph, and he's now going to bless others. It's interesting because he first says, God Almighty appeared to me in Luz. By the way, that was um, Bethel, if you remember. He renamed it the house of God because he goes, God was here, and I didn't know it. Luz and in the land of Canaan. So he first says, I was blessed by the Lord. And now he's about to pass that blessing on, and I find the principle that Jacob's been blessed, and so he's going to pass it on to others. The question is, have you been blessed? I think to him who was given, more will be given. But to him who has and does not use it, he's going to lose it. Jesus says it that way in a non-Jersey sort of way. Jacob hands God's promises to the next generation. He reminds these boys that they're picking up the... the they're, they're going to run the gauntlet, and they're the ones that are picking up the, uh, the, the torch, so to speak, and running with it. <clears throat> I'm wondering, if you knew that you were going to die, what would you hand off? What would you hand off? I know I got a garage that's completely littered with junk. <laughs> I'd be handing that off. But you wonder what's going to last beyond you, don't you? Like when your life is over and you come to the end, which could be today, tomorrow, or, you know, years from now, what will you leave? What have you been blessed with? I think we have responsibility to give it away, don't you? I think we do. And he tells him about all these parts of the promise, about what God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he passes it down. It's, gonna, it's, a, it's about people. They're going to get added. It's about the population. It's going to grow into a nation. It's about a place of permanent possession, the land of Israel, which everybody's still fighting over. 1948, there was a war. The next day, once they 
they declared it would be the, the you know, the, the gathering place of the Jews and their country. Uh, there was a war the very next day, onslaught by all the people. But see, it is a permanent possession given by God by covenant, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen? Amen. So there's no question as to where who Israel belongs to, whether it's Arabs or Palestinians or anybody else that lays claim to that land, or the Turks, because at one point they owned it, the Ottoman Empire, or uh, the Seleucids, or, you know, you can go back in time and look at all of the people who once owned that piece of property, and you can say, well, who do you give it to? It's the same thing Russia and Ukraine are arguing about now. Whose possession? And yet, it's a place of permanent possession, and God has declared it with an oath. And so, don't forget that. That's Israel. And what he speaks to them is, your offspring, whom you beget after you, shall be yours. So, uh, Joseph's told any other, any other children, offspring you have, they're, they're going to be yours, but these kids are mine. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padam, Padam Aram, you might know it as, uh, Rachel just died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way. There was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given to me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. I just find that a really interesting statement. He's, he's going on about Rachel and his travels with God and what's going on. And he goes, who are these kids? <laughs> You guys don't have like a grandparent or a parent that calls you by the wrong name? <laughs> um, uh, whatever your name is, come over here. <laughs> you've, you've, you don't see that, huh? I get that. But suddenly he's going on about Rachel, by the way. If you remember, Rachel gives birth to Benjamin. Um, and Benjamin wasn't his real name when he first got it. It was ben -Ami, which is uh, son of my pain and his father changed his name once Rachel had died because he didn't want to live with that name, ben, Benjamin, which uh, sounds similar, but it means son of my right hand, which uh, means my strength and my power because he had it in his old age. Um, he had a son. And so this is where she's buried, actually, um, near Bethlehem. And uh, so Rachel is there. Can you imagine um, going through all of that with your wife and having your wife die in your arms, giving birth to your son? He's been through, through, through a few things being 137 years old, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so he's remembering the past. He's remembering where he was and how God spoke to him and how he blessed him. And now he's going to pass that on, pass the torch to the next generation. And he's remembering his past as he goes through this. And he's also projecting into the future. And he's thinking about what's, what's going to happen. So... It's like, and in the middle of this conversation, he says, who are these kids? You guys know who these kids are? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what he does. It's like he's in the middle of remembering the past, and he goes, who are these kids? And I wonder if, if they weren't there the entire time and he didn't know, because he's blind, by the way. And so he's having a conversation with Joseph. He blessed Joseph, and then he goes, who are these? I wonder if they were whispering or if they were playing around or pushing each other. You know, they're boys, you know. Uh, but they're not little kids. You know, uh, all the Sunday school material you find will say that they were little children. But if you remember, he'd been there for 17 years and those boys were already born. So these are adults. They're not little kids, just so that you know. So when you look over the Sunday school literature, they'll, they'll tell you they were little children. Verse 10, and now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. That's why he didn't know that these kids were his kids. And then Joseph brought them near to him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both. Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and he brought them near to him. 
Now, this is a ceremony setup, okay? If you're wondering about all this stage right, stage left business. The right hand was always the preferred hand. Most people are right-handed. I guess you know that. Uh, you left-handed people, sorry. <laughs> you're the only ones in your right mind. And it, they account for about 10% of the population. Uh, but that's the, the, the left-handed people. The right hand was considered the, the hand of blessing. Okay, so um, I just know too much to be able to speak. <laughs> anyway, so there's the, there's the right hand and the left hand. The right hand is the preferred hand, the one in which blessing is conferred. And Joseph is getting all set up. So he's got his oldest on his left and his younger on his right. Because facing his father, his father is now going to bless the eldest, and then the youngest is on his left. And so Joseph is kind of getting him ready to pass on this blessing. And even at 137 years old, he can still bless other people. I don't know what sort of an excuse I can possibly make up for not blessing somebody else. Because I'm not 137 years, handicapped, in a bed, I... I I should very well be able to bless somebody in any way that they need. Right? How about you guys? What's your excuse? What do you, how do you justify in your mind not serving? 137 years old, he's still blessing. I think that's amazing. Jacob counts his blessings one by one. Notice, he says, I didn't even think that you were alive. And then suddenly I discovered you were alive. And now I get to see your kids. I mean, those of you who are grandparents, did you ever think that you'd be a grandparent? What a blessing, right? Amen. You can play with them, you can love on them, you can spoil them and send them home. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And, and those of you who, who don't have children don't understand what it's like to get all of that and then they produce children, which is like, holy macaroni, look at that. That's, that's some stuff. So he counts his blessings because he gets to see his son's offspring. In Psalm 37, 3, interesting passage Trust the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Feed on his faithfulness. That's an interesting little tab, isn't it? Yeah. To feed on the Lord's faithfulness. Do you see, Jacob has a heart of thanksgiving. He's thankful. He's not complaining. He's not laying there complaining about, oh, I'm blind. I can't see anything. Who are these kids? Oh, I didn't see them. I'm blind. You know, <laughs> Sorry. I think Rodney Dangerfield is always complaining about everything, right? <laughs> Take my wife, you know. He's not doing any of that. He's just thankful. He's, he's feeling the richness of God's blessing. And boy, what a great way to come before the Lord and feed on his faithfulness, to count your blessings one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. And remember those things of what God's done. Because you know, this world will try to tell you you don't have enough, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, and by golly, you've got to buy something new. And we'll start to think we're not enough, and yet the Lord said we are. And we can feed on his faithfulness and be thankful with very little. I find it amazing that people in other countries that just have a, a thatched roof over their head in climates that are way hotter than ours, and they're running around with bare feet and no clothes on. These people are happier than us. And we've got cars and houses and food and a fridge. Air conditioning. Air conditioning. Of which some of you ladies are cold this morning with. Thank God for that. <laughs> and feed on his faithfulness because God has been faithful to us. And then Israel stretched out his right hand and he laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger. And his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly. He's 137 and he's blind, but he knows what he's doing. And he's doing this. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life, my life long to this day, the angel, capital A, who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named among them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Amen. Now, we don't have anything like this, you know, this sort of coming of age thing or a blessing thing from fathers to sons. It's something that's kind of gone away. 
Um, there, are, there are semblance of it in other cultures, and we even have parts of it that are here, but um, it's been perverted and twisted to, to a million other things. But he's now passing on this blessing to them from God, which is a wonderful thing to do. And if there's any way that you can do that to your children and let them know how important they are and how much you love them and the reasons why, not just flattery, but to really bless them and strengthen them and encourage them to be who God wants them to be, it's a good thing to do. Amen? Amen. If there was a quality that you could pass on to your kids, what would it be? If you could get them a gift of passing on some kind of a spiritual quality in their lives from you, what would it be? It's a good thing to think about. But you also have to realize, if that's something you want to pass on to them, you have to be it. Because they're not going to listen to what you tell them. But they will learn from what you show them. So what is it that you want your kids to take with them when you're gone? You're going to have to purchase that with your very life. It's a serious thing. Anyway, I think about things like this. It's probably a little heavy for Sunday morning, but it's okay. In his prayer, he's giving thanks for his heritage. He's giving thanks for his parents. Now, his parents weren't all that in a bag of chips either. But he's grateful because the heritage of God's blessing came down through them. He's thankful for his daily bread because God has fed me to this day. How many have been fed to this day? You're, you're still being fed? Yeah, you got, you got something to be thankful for, right? Thanks for protection because the angel of the Lord, it's interesting, he calls him the angel of the Lord who came and spoke with him, the one who wrestled with him, the one who popped his hip out of joint, has protected him and watched him all this time. He's not complaining about his hip, notice. He's not complaining about his eyesight. He's thankful to God for every bit. He gives thanks for God's angel. Angel is the word messenger or angelos in the Greek. It's merely God's messenger, but there is one angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God is his son. In times past, he's spoken to us through the scriptures, but now he has spoken through his son. He is the messenger from God, the message from God. Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid the right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And so he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. So he's saying, dad, 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 no, 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 no. Linda, Linda. You're, you caught that. You're doing it wrong. You got to listen. I know you're blind at 137 years old. I set this up for you. And now you're messing me up with the, the whole crossing the hands thing. You, you ever see somebody do something like that? And you're just like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, like, like, like a child going to go put their finger in a light socket. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, that sort of angst you feel. And if you know if you get that, that's amazing because I feel that way all the time. It's like, ah. so his father refuses. God often enjoys reminding us that His sovereignty overrules firstborn status. You know the traditions of a firstborn getting a double blessing and all of that. God has the right over that. God has the right over all of our traditions. Amen. Amen? And he likes to remind us of it all the time. In fact, this is not the first time this has been done. You remember Cain and Abel, you know, who had the blessing? Abel did. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's wasn't. And it's interesting, Abel was the younger, right? So it starts right at the beginning. Ishmael and Isaac. Remember of Isaac, it is said that take your son, your only begotten son, and take him to a mountain, I will tell you, wait a minute, Ishmael's the older. But he was not blessed by God. Then you have Esau and Jacob. Remember Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? Esau was older. They were twins. You remember the whole situation, tying the little red thing and pulling him back in the womb. And, uh, anyway. <laughs> Reuben and Joseph. Reuben is the eldest. He's the one that should have a blessing. 
but he ends up going and sleeping with his stepmother, which disqualifies him. And then we see Simon and Levi, or Simeon and Levi, uh, they're the ones who destroy an entire town in Shechem. So they disqualify themselves from those blessings. And it's Joseph, who's number 11 out of 12, who's actually receiving the blessing, right? Ephraim and Manasseh, it's happening again. And he decides, I'm going to switch it up. It's interesting because it was his brother Esau that was supposed to have the blessing, and he got it by virtue of the Lord allowing him to. I just find that amazing. Aaron and Moses. Did you know Aaron was the older brother of Moses? And yet God didn't choose Aaron. He chose Moses. And then you have David over all his brothers. Remember, Samuel goes and he says, well, I'm going to find the next king of Israel. The Lord told me to come into this house. And he goes into his house and the oldest of the, the clan steps up and he goes, there's a fine boy there. Surely he's the king. He's got to be. And the Lord says, don't look at his appearance because I have rejected him. Man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. And he goes through all the children one by one by one by one by one. And the Lord says, uh-uh, nope, 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 nope. Click, click. What, no more sons? No, no more sons. Well, you know, there's, there's one. He's out in the field. He's watching the sheep, but he's the runt. You know, he's nothing to speak of. Bring him in. We won't be done with this until I see him. He comes in, and the Lord says, there he is. Little ruddy, red, red-haired boy out from the field, dirty and, you know, hey, Dad, I'm here. What do you need? You know, that's the next king of Israel. And he pours oil on his head in front of all of his brothers and his father, Jesse, and says, you are going to be the next king of Israel. God takes pleasure in taking those things that are nothing to bring to nothing those things that are. He takes pleasure in doing that. So can he use you? Are you low enough? I think so. I think I am too. And then Israel said to Joseph, behold, I am dying. But God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. By these reminding him of a promise. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and bow. So, by the way, there's a play on words here because that word portion here in the scripture is actually the word Shechem, which, is, which means portion. It's kind of an interesting thing when you start looking into the original language and you see some of the double entendres that are there. Uh, he, he talks about this double portion and he's going to give you a double portion. Well, he gave him a double portion because he blessed his kids. Joseph's not going to inherit anything because he owns everything. What's he going to get from dad? You know, possession wise, land wise, but his kids will. And so it's interesting. He uses this word. The only biblical record of this battle that he's talking about with the Amorites is 400 years into the future. There's no biblical record of him ever having to take land from Amorites, except for 400 years from now. I find that curious. Now, it may be that there was a battle, and maybe it was Amorites, but if so, it's not listed in the scriptures, and this is the only place where it's listed. But there certainly is in the book of Joshua, and they take this land from the Amorites. The property that he refers to it reminds me of a passage in the New Testament. You might know it from John chapter 4. John chapter 4, Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria. As he goes through Samaria, he stops at a well. And he meets a woman by the well. And she's a woman who doesn't have a great reputation. So she doesn't go first thing in the morning with all the other women. She goes in the middle of the day when no women would be there. No right person would ever go in their right mind on a super hot, arid day to go gather water. You do that first thing in the morning. But she's trying to avoid condemnation. So she goes, and Jesus has sent the disciples away to get something to eat, and he has this conversation with this woman by a well. And so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Isn't it interesting to link the New Testament and the Old Testament? Yes. This is a plot of land that was given at this moment as an inheritance. And I find it amazing that Jesus visits that place. 
And so Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so that's 12 noon for you folks. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And he asked her for a drink. And she begins to ask him questions about Jacob. Are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? And, and it's interesting. That's, it goes all the way back to when Jacob is handing this off to the descendants of Joseph. So I like little bits of trivia. They excite me. And so next week we're going to look at Jacob to continue to bless all of the other sons. And he, he waxes very poetic and very prophetic. And so we're going to talk about what all of those mean. And uh, we'll try to look at that and how it ties into the rest of time and the rest of scripture. So for right now, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And we'll have one more song of worship. I hope you guys are enjoying our walk through the book of Genesis as we, as we look at those who have gone before us, have had a walk with the Lord and been led by him in the past. It gives us something to look forward to in our own lives. Amen.